All right, this is Jim Van Groen, show number 187, as we come back from a Thanksgiving, two-week Thanksgiving break. And Tim's not with me tonight. Tim is off. I should have wrote this down because I don't remember exactly what he's off doing, but I believe it, his wife bought him tickets to a play or something for Christmas, and they're off seeing that play tonight. And so Tim will be back with us next week, but for tonight, it's just me and a returning guest. Greg, welcome to JPEG Raw. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me back. Awesome. I was looking, and last time we had you on was summer of 2015, so about a year and a half ago, um, back on whatever show that was. It's, it's quite a ways ago. And we had you on, and we were talking about a product that you, you wrote for Photoshop uh, called Lumenzia. Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. It's crazy. I was, I was looking back at that today, trying to figure out when we went on. I can't believe it's been that long. This last year has just completely flown by for me. Yeah, it, it has flown by for me too. I was looking at it, thinking it wasn't that long ago, but it was a year and a half ago. And also checked something out because you, you gave us a copy of Lumenzia back then, Tim and I. And I looked at what version do I have? Because I know that you recently released version two. And I have version 1.1. And I was, I was say, telling you in the pre-show, um, I have not upgraded. I know all your upgrades are free, so it's, it's nothing on you. This is all on me. I have not upgraded from version 1.1, but I, we were so impressed with what you showed us. Because you did a walkthrough with us back then on, on what it did. And you have lots of, of tutorials. Um, I was watching some of them last night. Lots of tutorials out there on your YouTube page also for people to look at. But if you don't mind, can you maybe catch me up on, I don't know if you want to go back that far to version 1.1, but what has changed since version 1.1 up to now? Yeah, well, it's it's, it's almost like a, a completely new program at this point. There's so much that's changed kind of under the hood. I've tried to keep the interface stylistically consistent just because um, when you first look at it, it looks like a lot of buttons, right? But it right. only actually does three things. There's basically a bunch of buttons that let you preview the mask you want, find the mask you want. You can customize it, you know, any way you want, you know, pick the, the colors you want to mask, pick, you know, the, the luminosity you want to mask, whatever you want to do. And then you basically apply it. And the third part is you can refine those masks. So it just kind of does three things. And I've tried to stick to that theme because I think once, you know, people understand that, you know, want to kind of stick with that paradigm, but, uh, you know, it's got a few more buttons since then and a lot of other features under the hood. But if I had to sum it up, I'd say it's um, it's gotten a lot more user friendly in terms of you know, a lot more intelligence under the hood to, you know, help see what you're doing and trying to help you along that path. So, um, you know, better air at you know, error handling or uh, better messages to kind of guide you down the path or um, smart detection of, of, you know, what kind of conditions you're in. So a lot of just sort of things that you really shouldn't notice. Mm -hmm. um, that are just kind of like taken care of, but, but feature wise, I try to think looking back, I, I kind of made a quick list today and, uh, it didn't even have pre-blend back when we did this last year, which is the, the utility that, that I use to pull together your images, automatically stack and align them and sort them. So you can start to blend exposures and you can do that manually, but it just facilitates that. And that's, I, I actually thought that was in the original version, but I didn't realize it wasn't in there until I looked back at my notes today. But uh, we've picked up uh, tool tips. So each of the different buttons will tell you, you know, what it's all about to kind of help guide the user. Um, groups and masks can be applied at the same time. So kind of a time saving thing. So if you want to put a luminosity mask just in this part of the image, you can do that really quickly. Uh, it'll help you find dust spots. So if you didn't weed that out in the raw conversion, it's got a utility that basically makes the dust spots really easy to find and fix. That wasn't uh, in version see, one one, was it? No, no, that's new. Okay. That was something like one four or one five, I think. Okay. Um, but a lot of people tell me they they love that. I, I you know I've always tried to take it out in the raw phase, but sure. you know you can forget or you miss something, and it's really nice because once you start to you know make all your adjustments on the image, you know those dust spots do start to show mm -hmm. up more and more. So if you can catch them a little bit faster, it's really helpful. Um, I did yeah. a similar thing for, for luminosity. Um, so when you're starting to blend images, sometimes you want to look at the image without color. So it's got a way of helping you see that. Uh, I'm going to do a demo at some point, but I, I've got this great image that um, I loved it, but I, there's a shadow of my tripod because the this blue light 
on the image for the early morning and there's kind of a yellow light behind me and it's casting a shadow of the tripod that's basically, you know, kind of blue and purple mixed across the image. And this uh, luminosity check is one of the things I use to actually figure out, you know, how much do I need to change the color versus the brightness? Um, added in a uh, split screen on it so you can actually see your mask and see your image at the same time. So as you edit the mask, you see the result on the image. Um, added a whole bunch of new sharpening options. Uh, dodge and burn got better. So there's an option that'll help you avoid color shifts. Um, there's a new um, selection tool called range. So you can pick two different tones in the image and it creates a mask between those two tones. So it's a completely great, great. custom mask. So you just click on, you know, maybe it's the brightest part of the, the wall, the darkest part of the wall, and I get the whole wall selected in one shot. Um, there's a lighter and darker function, which is totally unique to Lumenzia. It actually looks at the pixel, like normal lum luminosity masking would look at, you know, how bright or dark is my pixel or maybe how saturated is it. But it doesn't really think about that pixel, you know, in comparison to its neighbors. It's always in isolation. Uh, with the lighter and darker mass, it actually looks at, is that pixel brighter than its surroundings or darker than its surroundings? Um, and I'll, I, I can show you an example of when you would want to use that. But basically, if you have cast light on your image, a lot of times you can see that, you know, perhaps uh, you know, one object is brighter or darker than the thing that is in front of. But because the light being cast on it, a luminosity mask won't grab that whole object. So you end up having to make multiple masks. Mm -hmm. So with lighter and darker, you can just more quickly uh, identify that. Um, uh, the whole panel supports the lab color mode now, so you can edit end-to-end -end natively in lab. Um, wow. I added a second panel, the uh, Lumenzia Basics panel. So for people who are new to luminosity masking, you've got a second panel that comes free with Lumenzia, and it basically has um, all the different things that you know an expert might know um, but if you don't know all the different parts of luminosity masking or you don't know the various keyboard shortcuts, they're all right there. And it's got a few other you know, little things kind of beyond that, but it's really meant to be um, you know, helping a range of users. So instead of putting in the main panel, it's a separate thing that you could use if it applies to where you are with luminosity masks. Um, That's incredible. And, That's a ton of changes. So <laughs> I know that the list like kept going. It'll tell you if there's an active selection now. There's just... The, the list just keeps going. It's, um, there's been, since 1.1, there's been 10 more updates, major updates. Wow. Uh, and some other minor ones in between there. So I've, I've been pretty busy. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> incredible. And it's it, 10 updates, and it's only been, you know, when you think back, it's been a year and a half that we're talking about how long ago that was, and it doesn't seem like it's that long. But to do 10 updates in a year and a half is incredible. It was already, I remember when you we were on the show and you were demoing it, you walked through an image for Tim and I, and back then in version 1.1, we were so impressed that I ended up buying a copy for Tim and I because it was it's so good. I think... Might be confusing things whether you did this for us or I saw it in one of your videos where you had an image of a a, a building. I know a lot of you that doesn't narrow it down much, but <laughs> <laughs> an image of a building and and uh, you were selecting uh, the luminosity and over on one side, you know, you showing how on on one side of the image was about the same luminosity as a, as a part of the building was, and when you changed it, it changed both of them, but they were two different colors, so you were able to check choose it based on the color and only affect one of them, or you're able to erase out part of the, the mask. And just watching you walk through all that was just incredible. And of course, I think, yeah. I think you did one where, where there was an image with a bunch of uh, light dots on it, where the light was shining through something. It was like a stairwell or something, and the lights were shining through there, and you were showing us how you were able to adjust the, you know, doing it that fine tune. Yeah, I actually see that image right behind you right now, kind of rolling through that screen. Oh, yeah, yeah. The stairs are, yeah, it's... Um, actually, I, I, I pulled together a few images if you wanted to look at some before and after, because I thought I rather than showing yeah. software, I could show you some of the, the images. Um, actually, yes. Let me, uh, remember how do I, how do I screen share in Skype? I forgot now. Um, so I think it's on, under, no, you're screen. on the back. Go. Okay. You got it. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So let me know if this comes through. Okay. Yep. And I'm going to make you go full on my side, make you go full screen. Okay. Um, so th this is this is actually that image that you mentioned, yeah. and um, this is the actual original raw image. You know, no adjustments whatsoever, other than a little bit of perspective correction on this image. And then I edited it to get to this, and this is what I did in an earlier version of Lumenzia. 
and and these little dots in the background that's the kind of stuff i'm talking about yeah. where if you, if you look at that original you know some of these dots like in the the top right here these are super bright but if you look at like these dots here they're not that bright they're they're darker than these dots but the wall's brighter here so any luminosity mask you try and make you're going to pick up all sorts of different pieces of the background but the one thing that really stands out about this entire pattern is each of these dots is brighter than the wall around it. Right. So if you can just find the stuff that's brighter, you you get those that eye pattern. So I um, so I created this edit here, which which I liked. You know, it, you know, it's got a lot more punch to it, more color, or clean up the distractions. And I did work on these dots quite a bit, but I had to use probably four or five different luminosity masks and a lot of manual painting to get it done. Uh, whereas I did this final version with the new version of the panel in like maybe 10 minutes that automatically selected the dots. And, and this was the best, this version right here, this is the best that I could do with the old panel and with the new version. It just got to be a lot more consistent in the brightness. I think the pattern yeah, really jumps out a lot that, more. It does. Um, so yeah, so, so that was the idea of that whole lighter and, and darker function was, was situations like this. Yeah, that, that seems like a perfect one for this one. Because um, can you go back to the other one? Yeah, the, uh, this. Yeah. yeah, I can definitely see it in the the light pattern the nearest to us. It's like all of a sudden, in the the one before, all of a sudden, right before the hand railing, it kind of, you know, you know gets lighter. Yeah, I mean, this one. stuff right here is kind of a nightmare because yeah. it's so close to the surroundings that. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's pretty tough. I was doing a lot of custom masking to, to get it done. And, you know, it, it, with the new version, there's still some manual work. Sometimes you're going to pick up little grains that are brighter, things like that. But the mm -hmm. point is that it, it gets you much, much closer to that much final closer. point. Yeah. I, you know, I, I never take a, a tool and just use it and I'm kind of done. You know, back when I was doing HDR, I never put anything straight on the web that was HDR. It was always blended with other layers. Same thing with luminosity masking. I never take a luminosity mask as it is. I'm always doing something to take it a step further, making it, you know, a little bit more precise or, um, you know, better selecting the area you want or whatever it needs. So there's always a little bit of something. But, you know, I'm always trying to get that workflow to be a little faster. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that. I would probably would have given up. I would have done it in the first place if I didn't have your product for this. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, I do want to mention if you're out there and on YouTube Live watching and commenting, head over to our live page. I'm not really monitoring the chat and and you on YouTube, but head over to our live page, which is jpeg 2 slash live, and and that I am watching a chat over there. So, um, there is a question. From someone that says, "What what monitor are you using?" Oh, uh, right now I'm on the uh, new 2016 MacBook Pro. Just got this three days ago. Awesome. awesome. So it's uh, it's great. I, I came from a 2014 uh, MacBook. Actually, if you go to my blog right now, the first two uh, blog articles are about my experience with the new laptop, which is pretty mixed, to be honest. Uh, but the screen is really nice. It's a lot brighter than the old screen, and it's got the P3 color gamut. And I, I didn't expect to see much difference. I haven't even calibrated the screen yet, um, but it's it's nice. It definitely is an improvement. So I'll go over to the blog, and where do I go? Uh, if you're just on the home screen, it's right at the top there. So the first two articles, yeah, the, with the how to save files much faster in Photoshop. Yeah, there's that, and um, there should be a newer article above it. Oh, okay. I'll have to, I'll have to okay. check that. I had, I had some website issues today, so maybe it didn't publish correctly. It should be there. Um, but I, I did uh, – one was on – because the, the irony, one, one of my disappointments with this thing, there are a lot of things I like about it, but one of the disappointments is the 2016 MacBook Pro, even though it has a hard drive that is two to three times faster than the old one when I test it with uh, Blackmagic, uh, which is a, a disk speed testing program, mm -hmm. the new laptop actually saves Photoshop files more slowly – uh, I took a 900 meg image file. It's a multi-layered TIFF file that I was blending. Pretty typical of my work. And if I save a PSD file with the old laptop, it was done in 41 seconds. And with the new laptop, it was like 48 or 49 seconds. So wow. uh, you would think it'd be faster, but um, do you know anything? Those files, Go ahead. Uh, those, those files they're compressed. Right, you know, a PSD file is compressed by default, yeah. and so if you turn off compression, it'll save in like, you know, three and a half seconds. So it is faster if you turn off compression. But 
once you turn on compression, something in that compression chain, and I think it might just be the boost speed, uh, is actually slower on the new laptop than the old one. So it takes longer, which is really weird. Yeah. You never know. Um, and I don't know. You'd have to look at what, what are your hard drive specs. You know, somewhere in the chain, something's slowing it down. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's the best I can figure out is that CPU because the hard drive is definitely faster. But. Well, Greg, you know, we love, we so loved your product. Uh, oh, did you want to, were you going to show more or did you want to, um, what'd you want to yeah, do? Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've got a few images here. Okay. If you want to see them, I, I thought, you know, uh, I mean, we kind of covered Lumenzia, you know, in pretty good depth last time and obviously yep. it's changed a lot, but I thought it might be interesting to show a little bit of kind of behind the scenes of my work. Absolutely. Yeah, it'd be awesome. So I've, I've got some more. These are more kind of before and after images. Does this come up? Yep, I got it. Okay. So th this is a shot of the Tokyo Sky Tree in, in Japan, of course, that I did with a long exposure. Uh, it was on the uh, the Sony A7R II, which was honestly a little bit of a gamble for me. That, that sensor makes me nervous um, for long exposures, and it was a pretty warm day. It was, you know, 70 or 80 degrees out probably. Uh, but it, you know, I, I did do some, some hot pixel work on this, but, um, I took this probably something like a five minute exposure it was double stacked. You can really see the, the vignetting as well as the, the color shift on it. Yeah. But so this is the original unretouched image. And then this is the final black and white that I did in Lumenzia. Wow. So, and, and, and this was a lot of fun for me. I haven't done a lot of long exposure, black and white. I, I love them. Um, I've always wanted to do more, but um, I just honestly I haven't had that much time for a lot of my editing lately. Yeah. Um, but it was it was a fun project to really kind of teach myself how to how to do this sort of thing. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so then I've got uh, this is another this is a local shot. So this is okay. about 15 minutes from my house here in Minneapolis, uh, and that's the Mississippi River, which actually starts in Minnesota. <laughs> so and, I used to live at the other <laughs> end of that. <laughs> I used to live down in uh, about 70 miles south of New Orleans, uh, uh, less than a mile away from the Mississippi River. It did not look that clean back then <laughs> where I was. <laughs> it's a little bit smaller up here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but th this, was, um, this was an interesting shoot for me. I, I was out shooting with a friend of mine, and I actually didn't bring the right component to connect my camera to the tripod. So... Uh, my buddy was uh, managing his kid and he said, Hey, why don't you just take my tripod? So it was kind of this funny shoot and he was super nice to lend me his tripod. And, uh, I got this and it was uh, a, a little bit, um, just, well, a lot really just not capturing the mood. It was, uh, it was actually a really colorful sunset. But by the time I captured it, the color was a little bit more faded and it wasn't all quite here. Um, but this is one that I took into lab and then worked on in Lumenzia and landed on this final image Ooh, and and obviously the sky wasn't quite that pink but it was pretty close and this really captures to me what it felt like to be there it was a pretty stunning sunset and so you know this original i was i was you know not sure exactly what to do and and uh taking this into lab you can really do some amazing stuff to extract the color i didn't paint that color on i really pulled it out of the image so it's it's in the file you just got to work a little bit to get it Good gosh, look at that difference. So that was um, – and then this is a, a shot I did over in, in London at the Natural History Museum, um, which was a, an interesting shoot. I really had to do some, uh, some sweet talking to take this thing. I shot it on a tripod, and they are not big fans of tripods, especially in front of a very busy escalator. But uh, I was able to, to uh, get permission to do this. And it's you, you, you uh, took, got it when no one was there. It was it was it was at the right time of day. There were yeah. a lot of people coming through, um, but I it's actually a long exposure. The, this escalator was shut off okay. at this point, okay. um, so no one was on the escalator. It was just a matter of the people around it to the sides, and you, okay. you'll see a little bit in the next image. Um, so I had this one exposure here where the foreground looks great, the uh, the lights on the backdrop around the stars look great. Obviously. The uh, that red earth in the background is totally blown out. There's there's nothing to recover there. It's it's you know the the color is blown. Um, so I took this this other image where that earth looks great, and you can see down here you know people walking through yeah. my frame, okay. you know on, yeah. on both yep. sides of it. So so it's definitely a busy area. I mean I I took this pretty fast. This is 
one of those moments where you just kind of suck it up and you do the best you can and, and it worked out really well. Uh, but so I took those two exposures and combined them to create this for a, a finished image. Oh man, that is gorgeous. Look at that. So it was it was a lot of Lumenzia blending to get the top of this in, uh, bringing out a lot more detail in the stars. If you look at this original image, it's kind of flat. I was bringing out a lot more of the, the detail there. And then one of the finishing steps, and I, I created a, a video of this on my YouTube channel, but obviously the escalator is static. Mm -hmm. So I used the, uh, the path blur to, to blur this, which is kind of an interesting thing to do because normally blurs are kind of linear. But, you know, these pixels are moving diagonal this way and these are moving diagonal this way and these railings are kind of moving up and changing direction. So the, the path blur is the perfect tool to, to do this sort of thing. And, um, you know, I, I think it makes for a much more interesting image when you feel that energy moving, you know, through the, the image that way. Absolutely, yeah. No, you do get you get the sense that, that, that it's moving. I would have never, I didn't see that you would have uh, created that in, in Photoshop. So, wait, Lumenzia can take two images and stack them together? Yeah, so that, that pre-blend function I was mentioning, okay. you basically would, would stack you know, one layer on top of another, and you don't need to use pre-blend. It just kind of helps facilitate it. And then what you can do is, for example, in this area here, I would load up a selection of the highlights. Maybe this is like a lights three or four. You know, I'd have to play with it to tell you what it is. But you create a selection of that and, and you load it as a selection, not as a mask. And then you would take this other image and you would paint through that selection on a layer mask. So you're basically revealing this part okay. of this and then the two come together like this. Um, and and I've, I've got some exposure blending videos. If you click the tutorials button in Lumenzia that show, you know, some of how I do this on a, on another landscape image. Um, and I, I don't think I showed it in this tutorial on YouTube where I blended this. I just showed the, the blurring, but okay. I did show the layers. So if you looked at those layers in that video, you'd, you'd get a sense of it. But that's, that's the basic idea is I'm, I'm revealing, you know, the good parts of, you know, all Amazing. this stuff in the foreground and the good parts here. And the luminosity mask is what's letting me create that selection in a way that's, you know, nuanced and, and looks real. Yeah, and you have a lot of good YouTube videos out there that are very helpful. I was watching some of them just recently, and um, that's when I w went back and to see which version I had of, you know, when we bought it back in summer of 2015. Because um, I didn't remember that, not because I've, I, I really, to be honest, had not spent the time with it that I need to. Um, it did, it was much easier than doing it, you know, the mask yourself, but I just haven't uh, spent the time with it. But now watching all this, I got to go get the new version. And you mentioned early on the new, you know, all updates are free. So I can go from one, one to two Oh, and I need to tell Tim to do the same thing if he hasn't already done it. Yeah. Well, and if you want to, you know, jump right back into it, I've got a, I, I've, I've also been expanding the tutorials. So as I've added features, there's new tutorials. Uh, and there's a video right at the, the top of the support when you click on tutorials that okay. is called the quick start video. And that kind of goes through all the high level stuff. And that's a, a really good place to just kind of quick get after it. So you don't have to, you don't have to watch all the tutorials to start using it. Okay. Where did you say this image was taken at? So this is in London at the natural history museum. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm, glad. I'm so, surprised yeah, I let not, you set up a tripod. Yeah. You know, um, it was all about strategic patience and approaching the right person. And I got management approval to do it. Okay. Um, you know, so it was, it was definitely some sweet talking to, to make this happen. You're not going to walk in there with a tripod and just take the shot. They'll kick you right out. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, you know, pay, pays to, uh, pay, pays to work with people, find the right people and, you know, make an ally. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And a lot of things in life and a lot of things in life. You know, one of the things, uh, you know, uh, I am still a member of a quite a few uh, communities over on G+, but most of them are inactive. But you you still have a, a fairly active um, G+, community around this product, right? Uh, very active, yeah. Several posts a day. So it's I've got, I run a couple of different communities. I've got one specifically for Lumenzia users that's on Google+. So those are all Lumenzia customers. And then I've got another group on Facebook that's just open to anybody who's interested in, in luminosity masking. So yeah. there's certainly plenty of people there who don't have or use Lumenzia. 
Uh, that's just facebook.com slash group slash luminosity masking. I think it's, it's linked off my site. Um, but they're, they're both really active. I mean, every day there's several posts. So it's, that's been a lot of fun because the thing about luminosity masking is it's kind of an infinite range of choices. So, you know, I'm learning a lot about how I can make Luminzia better. People are teaching me new ideas. I'm teaching them. It's, it's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, most of the posts are other people interacting with each other. So it's just yeah. a great place for people to connect. It's not, it's certainly not all about me. I don't have enough time to, to be on it every day. I, I really try my best. But. Well, I thought, it, you know, it's a great, when you find a community around whatever product it is you're using, um, be it, you know, a, a gas grill or, you know, Lum, Lumina, Lum, Luminzia, um, here, you find a community around it. It's so much it's so much nicer to have another group of people who are using it along with you that you can learn from and, and help from. And I know it's it's probably the only Google Plus group that I still get messages every day, like you said, messages every day. There's been five posts and um, you know, in, in the community. And like so I knew it's a very active community over there where uh, you can share and learn from others. Yeah, it's and, it's fun. I enjoy it. And I, do you, you have a link to that on your um, page, your website, or do we? Do you just go over to Google Plus and look it up? What's the easiest way to find it? The, well, the Google Plus group is just for folks who buy Lumenzia. So okay. anyone who buys Lumenzia, there's a, a a link you'll get to, you know, be invited into that group. The, hey. the Facebook group is linked right off my page, okay. my website. Well, there's another uh, another clue that I did buy the product because I am a member of that group. <laughs> 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 I forgot. I do remember that now. You sent me a link after after that. Um, and if somebody wants to buy uh, Lumenzia, they go over to gregbenzphotography.com and then um, what tutorials? Wait, what tutorials and actions? If you if you just put in gregbenzphotography.com slash Lumenzia, you okay. go straight there. Yeah. Okay. And then from there, you can you can buy it. Yep. Yeah. All right. And. Um, we're going to JPEG to Raw, as you know, we I told you in the pre show, we uh, do an annual best of contest, photo contest, Greg. And this year we're going to buy a copy and we're going to give it away to to somebody. I don't know, um, you know, it's going to be first place, second place, a random person, whatever, whatever it's going to be, but we're going to buy a copy and give it to somebody who enters. That's all I'll say for now. Who's going That's to awesome. Yeah, yeah, because it's a great, it's, it's a great product. You, not just landscapes, there's lots of different, you know, uh, different things you can use it for. Uh, lots of different types of photo photos. Yeah, you know, I, my my examples are all pretty much landscape and cityscape, but uh, a lot of folks using it are are doing portraits and all sorts of interesting stuff. I, I wish that I did more of that work myself to show it off, but I've been blown away at. Uh, the kind of work I see, I've, I featured a couple of guys on, on my site, uh, already who uh, the work's stunning, both, uh, guy named, uh, Kareem El, El Daghetti, who's, uh, he's an Egyptian guy living over in Dubai and he's just got the most stunning images, uh, from Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Uh, and another guy from Brazil, uh, Jackson Carvalho, who, uh, he's an interesting guy. He, he does these just amazingly surreal, uh, images, you know, the day to night scenes and things like that. Um, but also some stuff he's been doing out of his trip to Africa. And then he's a completely separate line of stuff he does with a bunch of nude models. And you know, he's this expert in multiple domains. I, I love seeing that. It's just been amazing to see what, what people do with it. Yeah. Well, and you just said with models there, so it's not just uh, landscape, it's people too, um, that you can use it with. I can't show the nudes here on the show, but <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Did you want to show them more? Or did you want to um, move yeah, on? Uh, you, you know, yeah. Want, want to show you a couple quick ones, and, okay. and we'll move on. So this was, um, you know, this is another one that I think is kind of interesting because it's a, it's a, you know, uh, you know, C stack that um, is a beautiful C stack, but to get the wave action, you really kind of shoot wide to mm -hmm. to get the flowing motion. So this is the original raw, and then this is adjusting that raw just in, in Lightroom, just kind of basic adjustments, nothing too uh, difficult or fancy there, but just bringing out the colors. And I love how that looks, except that the C stack looks tiny. You know, mm -hmm. it's just not, it, it doesn't capture how you felt. And if you zoom into it, then you're going to lose this foreground in the water. So I took another image, you know, the first one, this is about 14 millimeters and this one's about 35 uh, oh, these are out of sequence. There we go. Um, 
But so this is zoomed in, uh, and this is already blended. So this is not the original image. I took this larger C stack and I dropped it in this. So you can see here's okay. kind of the original, and then I drop this in, and you know that work gets a little bit trickier on the edges of the waves. But this isn't the worst job in the world to to do without luminosity mass. But it, it definitely helps. Where things really get tricky is if you look at this reflection. Yeah. This is still the reflection of the previous you know, shot. This previous, yeah. yeah. So, you know, how do you get that reflection? You know, the zoomed-in image doesn't have this water; it has different water. So, I needed to basically select. You know, if you look at what's in here, all the the light parts of the wave. That's what stays white, and the dark spots get dark. <laughs> and so, that's perfect for luminosity masking. And I was able to select it and create this fake shadow of this larger rock. Um, so yeah, it was a really fun project, but that was, you know, that was really kind of the magic there. So this is an example of, you know, what I would call, um, you know, focal blending or focus blending. It's, you know, different focal length lenses blending them together. And then, you know, with the water, they're getting really tricky. And that was not, not an oh. easy thing to do. So uh, yeah, but, it looks incredibly difficult without, I don't, I don't know how you would do it without your uh, product. I, <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> well, I wouldn't you, attempt you, it. I mean, you you could certainly do it with just using uh, luminosity mass, but it, it it's a lot of work. I yeah. know you do it, but it was it was fun. Uh, and I'll show you I'll show you one more here. And I, I know you wanted to kind of talk uh, uh, work and and uh, career change. So we'll, I was uh, hoping we'll this was the one you were going to pick. So th this yeah. is one of my favorite shots of Minneapolis, and it looks it looks terrible here. Um, because this is the actual raw okay. and then here's a second raw. So I, I liked the clouds here, the way they open up over the buildings and then I have another raw and I like the starburst. So I got the sun between these two pillars on the right day of the year at the moment it hit the crest on the horizon to create the starburst. So it was okay. pretty, pretty lucky scenario. And then I got another exposure later when all the city lights are on. Now, this looks a lot more bright in the foreground, but I didn't use this. I actually used um, this exposure right here, all the foreground of the final image. Okay. But what I used this for is I grabbed all these city lights on the different buildings and the foreground here. I didn't use this path because I think it's distracting, but that's kind of the beauty with this mask is you can pull in just the things you want, uh, but I blended those all together into this finished image. Oh, my gosh. That's gorgeous. So how long so, did it take you to – so give me an idea of how long it would have taken you to, to create this final image. Um, it probably took me around an hour and a half to, uh, to create this. Okay. The, uh, getting the foreground on this was actually pretty easy. These two trees were too bright. I spent a lot of time to get these trees toned down. They were actually you – know, like if I go back to the raw, you know, if, I, if you were to look bright this up, well, you can't see it here. But but these trees were, were right. a problem. So I, I fixed those. I did I did some work to make sure that the crest of the hill got the uh, attention here. Uh, I cleaned up some of the little bits of cloud that were kind of stray little bits out here. Um, you know, got the rays enhanced. You know, all, all that was not too bad. But these city lights to bring these in was a lot of decisions. What lights do I want to turn on, and how do I effectively blend them? And if you look at this gold metal flower sign here. I had to reconstruct this sign because if I go back in this here, you may oh, not be able to quite it's blown see it out here, part of it. Yeah, it's well, it's not just blown out, but not all the letters light. So there was some damage to the the bulbs weren't all working. So I had to fix parts of like the R and the L weren't lit. Um, wow. So there, there's a there's a lot of little subtle things going on here, things you can't even see on the web that you know were because this is an image that I definitely plan to print. So I mm -hmm. really took care of all the, the little details. So yeah, probably, probably about an hour and a half. It was pretty involved. That's, that's definitely on the longer end of how much time I like to spend on an image if possible. Well, the final product looks gorgeous. Yeah. Are you going to print this for you personally and, and mount it? Or do you sell these, uh, these images? I, I do. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, one of the things I want to do. So I, I, I do want to sell this image. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, probably put this up at home. I guess it kind of depends on, uh, if Megan agrees with me on that or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. and this was one, this is the one I was hoping you'd uh, when you had the thumbnails, I was hoping this is the one you would go to here. Cause this one, the final product look, you know, most of them look great. All of them look great. Just, uh, this one looks really interesting. 
Yeah, well, and this to me is a, a really good example of what you can do with luminosity mass to not only bring out a lot of detail, but also to blend different moments in time, you know, to take these lights from late at night and, and the, the daylight images. I mean, these are, there's some color shifts going on in here. There, there's a lot of subtleties. I didn't just put it, you know, a light and blend mode on that. There's a lot of little things that you got to do to, to make that all stack together because sure. there's a significant color shift from the, the two different images. But, you know, you end up with, I, you know, if you hadn't told me all this and I just looked at this image, I get the feeling of um, a, a sunrise or a sunset. I, I, I wouldn't maybe know which one it was, but I, the image has that feel of a sunrise or a sunset. Which one is this? Sunrise? Is this, this is a sunset. Sunset. Okay. It has the feeling of that. So you've kept it in bounds. And I am glad now looking at the final product, you didn't put the light along the trail because that would have been distracting. Yeah, I, I actually did that work. So I in my layered file, one? it's in there. Yeah, yeah and I kind of played with, you know, if I turn up the opacity a little bit, you know, do I like it with a little bit? And they're just, I didn't like it in any situation. It's not really telling a story. I, uh -huh. I always like my images to kind of have direction and flow and tell a story. And there's, there's nothing about this path that is important and it doesn't lead anywhere. So I just kind of took it out in terms of the color. Yeah, so. I, I like, you know, the, the, the gray path going through there kind of gives, I like that subtle feel of it. I think it would have been too overpowering if you, it easily could have been too overpowering. I do like that you still have the, what is that, the trail lights or the, the, the brake lights or whatever of the image of the cars there, right? Oh, yeah, the cars there, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that was one thing I wanted to do. So everything in this image is is kind of moving you towards the sun, you know, all the lines of the buildings, the roads. Uh, you know, and if I had lit this trail, yeah. it's not really moving in that direction. So it, it, it looks fine. It breaks up the image nicely as it is. But when I, when I grab this light, it's just too much. It really, it draws too much attention to itself. Yeah. I feel like if I sit here long enough, I'm going to watch the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is going to change and I'm going to see the, the sunset change. I mean, it, it gives me that kind of feeling that, uh, yeah. you know, it has life to it. Yeah. Yeah, Incredible. it was it was a fun image. It was it was tough. I had to I had to get access to the building, and uh, it's shot on a tilt shift on a diagonal. So this is shifted, you know, up and to the right to uh, to pull this thing off, and and then there was all the blending. So there were a lot of a lot of elements to this image. So I, you know, it's it's probably hard to appreciate that when you look at the image, but I take kind of special pride in what it took to make this one. So now you're up on the roof, or are you up on a floor that just had you know a balcony or something? What where are you at? Yeah, I was on a private balcony. Okay. In my small town, there's there's you know I live outside of Atlanta, so there's tons of buildings downtown Atlanta. But in our town, uh, not too far from here, there's a building that I don't know maybe six seven stories. I'd love to get access to the roof. Did you know somebody there? Or did you just walk in and and ask? <laughs> I, I had a friend who lived in the building who knew the residents of this unit. So I, okay. I had a pretty good in and, and they're just the nicest people. They're unbelievably nice. So it, they've actually become good friends of mine. So um, just kind of one of those serendipitous things. You never know. I, I'm constantly trying to find ways to, you know, get some new angle in the city, get on a rooftop, get on a balcony and you strike out a lot more than you have moments like this or that elevator shot. You know, I, I get told no a, a lot, but you keep at it. So you're saying I should probably make, try and make more friends. <laughs> it's always good to have more friends. That's true. <laughs> well, hey, there's a question out in chat. It's unrelated to what we're talking about, but as, as long as it's out there, let me uh, address it. It says, what's the best lens for my Canon full-frame camera for football, soccer, and shooting high school and hopefully college? Especially thinking about 2.8, at least 300 millimeter. All right, you know, light is going to depend upon your. Let me let me get our shot back here. You want to stop? You need to stop screen sharing, I guess. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, depends on what you want to spend. You know, if you're wanting to spend, if you want a 300 millimeter 2.8, you're going to spend some money for that, for that lens. And with the full frame, you won't have quite the reach. I have a Sigma. It might be the one that's up on that camera right behind me, but you can't see it. It's too dark. I have a Sigma 120 to 300. They have it both for the Nikon and for the Canon and maybe something else. It's a 2.8 lens. Uh, it's full reach is 300, which if you're doing college and high school football and soccer, 300 
on a full frame camera is probably not going to be enough reach. Uh, you may need a teleconverter or even go further. So, and if you're wanting 2.8, it's going to get expensive. Yeah, those are pretty tough. I, I've shot occasional sports. I got some friends who do it and a lot of them are pulling out the 400 millimeter 2.8 to, to do that. Uh, if you're shooting daytime though, no reason you can't, you know, be a little more economical and grab like a 70 to 200 and get a 2x teleconverter. Now you're yeah. shooting at f5.6, so you're not going to shoot in low light and your focus speeds are impacted. But, you know, a lot of times it might be all you need, kind of depending on what you're doing. Or um, if not, probably the best way to do it is just go out and rent a lens. You know, you pay yeah. a, a reasonable day fee for the, the number of times you use it, unless you're professional, that's probably the way to go. Yeah, it is going to be a trade off. If you're shooting during the day, you can go with something like that. You could, you know, on the Nikon side, I know she said Canon, or he said Canon. Uh, there may be the, the Canon uh, uh, version of this, but on the Nikon side, I think there's like an 80 to 400, five, six lens. So that would be okay during the day if you had a lot of good light. But if you're shooting, and that may be good for. That lens right here. Yeah. There's, so it's a, it's a great lens. I would not shoot sports with it. Too slow um, focusing. I think it's a little so it's it's you know and just the handling of it the the, the seventy two hundred to me handles a little nicer. You certainly can do it. There's no reason you can't, and it does have a, a really nice anti vibration system on it, so you can handhold this thing pretty slow. But the problem is when you're shooting sports, it doesn't matter if you can handhold it. It's you know right. can you stop the the player moving? Exactly, you need the shutter speed to stop it. If you're shooting football, high school football, you're probably shooting late that in the afternoon or even at night, and you're going to need that two eight. Um, so. I, you know, I need to know more, more information on how much money you want to spend. But Greg had a great suggestion is narrow down your selection and then maybe rent one or two of them and see what you're willing to 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 use and how much it's going to cost. All right, Greg, so let's get to oh, – do you have something to add? Oh, I, I was going to say, you know, and, and don't be afraid to crank up the ISO. I, I take a lot of portraits at ISO 6400. If you've got a modern full-frame sensor, that thing can really go a lot further right. than you think once you clean up the noise. Absolutely, yep. Um, okay, so let's get to the main topic. And uh, I love talking about Lamenzio, but I want to talk about this topic too. And this is, I got your newsletter. I subscribed to your newsletter. And I got your newsletter, I don't remember exactly when it was. Uh, I don't have a date here. But it wasn't that long ago. And the title was, I Just Dropped the Mic. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, that caught my attention. Like, what is he talking about? What is Greg talking about there? So tell us, tell us what, that, what you meant by that. So, um, for a lot of folks who've, who've known me through Lumenzia, which is, you know, I think what I'm really known for these days, um, I think a lot of people assume I was doing this full time, uh, but it's really something I was doing on, you know, nights and weekends and, uh, just a lot of adrenaline and lack of sleep, I guess. Uh, I had a, a full time corporate, uh, job. I was working in the medical devices industry as a marketer and, uh, left that job at the end of July. So... Um, that's a job I'd have had for a little over 10 years. Uh, it's been phenomenal, uh, really good people. Um, uh, I, I couldn't say enough nice things about the people I worked with and, and the, the working environment is great. Um, but I finally at the point where it's just, there's just too much stacked into my life. There's, you know, uh, not enough time to try and excel at two things. And I wanted to be great at something, not good or mediocre in a, in a couple of things, um, so I gave my notice, um, gave myself a couple months off. So I did a lot of, uh, a lot of cycling and reading and catching up with friends. And, um, I thought there might be a few days when I did nothing but watch movies or something, but it never, <laughs> never seemed to happen that way. I just, I think I got a new appreciation for why, uh, why my parents are so busy in retired life. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, around the time I sent that email is when I started full-time photography. So I, I had been planning this move for, for really a kind of a couple of years, built out a full fledged business plan, had a bunch of friends beat it up with me. You know, I'd been working on, you know, the financial transition and everything for a long time. So this is something that's been coming for a long time, um, but wasn't really quite ready to, to share until recently. Um, so it's still very new to me. I'm really probably, I guess, about three months into it. Well, you know, it's something I think a lot of photographers dream about. A lot of people outside of just photography, but specifically photographers dream about, especially if they're getting a little business on the side. Maybe they're busy on weekends. Maybe every weekend they're busy shooting and doing that kind of stuff. You know, more than like me, who's just an amateur and really has no uh, dreams or, or, or um, 
skills to do that full time. But, you know, there's a lot of people that are, are in that boat that aren't they're, they're debating when is the right time? When is the time for me to cut this off? And maybe in their mind they're thinking I've got to have enough the same income from my weekend job that I got from my day job and then I can quit. But that seems to squeeze everything in a weekend and only give it, you know, um, that much work, it's going to be very difficult to have that money equal your day job money and then quit. It seems like you're going to, when you quit, you're, you're probably going to have to supplement some of that, that earnings from your new full-time job with some savings or some cost cutting until you can ramp that one back up. What, what do you think there? What is the right time? Well, I, you know, and, and, and I'm certainly in that boat now. Um, you know, Lumenzia is not going to be a full income for me. It, it covers a lot of costs, but you know, every month my bank balance is, is dropping. So I'm, I'm investing in, you know, a new career, but I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not, uh, covering all my costs just yet. So I, I've got a lot of work to do, but go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, but I was, I was gonna say to me, there's, I think there's three elements that, um, that you need to have, uh, first you need to be passionate about other people's problems. Mm-hmm. I think probably the biggest thing that trips up people who want to do any sort of arts, whether it's music or painting or photography or pick your, your passion, your hobby that you want to do full time. It really doesn't matter if you're good at it. It matters if someone else cares that you're good at it or they care what you do. Cause if at the end of the day, you're not providing something valuable to another human being, there will be no money in it and you won't be able to continue doing it. So if you just want to do the things you want to do and they're not relevant to other people, or, uh, you don't know if they're relevant to other people, that to me would be a, a point to say, Hey, you know, maybe this is not something I should pursue as a, a career yet, or I should figure out how do I take the skills I do have and turn it into something, you know, that somebody does want. Um, cause I, you know, there's a lot of different things I do with photography that they're just for fun. I, I couldn't make any money on. So you, you be passionate about other people's problems. That's, that's the most important. Um, the second I would say is you've got to be ready to work hard. Um, you know, as a, you know, uh, an MBA, you know, in a marketing role, I was making pretty good money mm-hmm. and you know, that income is gone. I am rebuilding from zero. I have uh, Lumenzia, which, you know, as happy as I am about it, is definitely uh, not even uh, remotely close to, to closing that gap. So I've got a lot of work to do. Um, and since I started this three months ago, I've worked almost every single day. And I've had some nights where I'm working until midnight, 1.30 in the morning. Um, so I've been really busting hump to, uh, to start executing my plan. I got about eight years of ideas in my head, and now I'm racing to start executing. <laughs> Um, you know, but it doesn't feel like work to me. I'm passionate about it. Um, and it's not about the photography for me because I'm probably not shooting more now than I was before. It's, it's all the other business aspects. I love, you know, working on the video stuff. I love working on the blog. I I even love the accounting. It's interesting to me. So, um, all those various aspects and the lifestyle that's wrapped around it, you know, if I can do the same work the way I want to do the hours I want to do it, it doesn't feel as much like work to me, but I am working very hard and you need to be ready for that. Uh, and then the third is just having a good plan. Uh, I don't think you want to just jump into things because you've been thinking about it and you're anxious. Um, I put together about a 12 page business plan, beat it up with a bunch of friends. It was something I was developing for quite some time. I've, you know, figured out here are the different ways that I think that I can go make money. Um, here are the things that can trip me up, you know, and, and, you know, here are the things I'm not going to do. That's one of the most important things is, you know, like I said, I've got about eight years of ideas. That's how long I've been doing this semi-professionally. If I move in all these different directions, I will fail because I won't be able to execute Mm -hmm. at a high level on all those things. I need to pick a few things and do them really well. At least that's my belief in, in how success will come for me and what I'm trying to do. Um, but so, yeah, so those, those three things, you know, be passionate about other people's problems, be ready to work really hard and, and have a solid game plan. Yeah, that was, there was a lot there. And I was think I read an article recently 
um, about you know telling about this very subject about quitting your day job and, and becoming a full time photographer. And one of the things it said was think about when you went into your interview, and maybe this doesn't apply for everybody, but think about when you went into the interview for that day job and you were trying to get that day job. And the, the, maybe the person on the other side was saying, why should I hire you? This is the question I ask when I'm interviewing people. Is let's say I have two Gregs. They're both MBAs. They're both, you know, uh, very similar. Why would I hire you over the other Greg? And I want to hear what that person's going to say. Um, and, you know, maybe you've got a similar question like that. And what you say is, because I will work hard. I will do what it takes to get the job done. And, you know, no one will be a harder worker than me. And you did that. Maybe you got in the job. You did that work. You really worked hard to move and move your way up. And you enjoyed your work. You enjoyed your coworkers. That's the kind of effort you're going to have to put in and more into your own job when you're working for yourself. And you got to ask yourself, are you willing to do that now that you're working for yourself? It's not all about watching daytime TV. You know, you may be working harder now than your other job. But it's when you're working for yourself and you got to have that passion, a good entrepreneur uh, you got to have that passion to do that. And the other thing, key thing you said is having a plan because so many businesses fail in their first year or whatever it is because they don't have a plan. They, you know, maybe were um, cash poor to begin with, have to take out loans right from the beginning to get their equipment. And, you know, they're just going to, they're going to a quick, you know, dive to bankruptcy or something. So you got to have, you got to have a little bit of time and have a plan, like you said, to bridge that gap, because when you quit, there goes that day job, there goes all that money, there goes all those benefits, and you got to ramp yourself back up. But then all that work you're doing is for you. Yeah, you know, I, I think when people make the transition, benefits seem to come up a lot, especially for Americans where your health insurance is tied to your employment. Not right. not true really in any other country that I can think of, but in the U.S., that's a scary notion and certainly something I thought about. Once you get over that, once you realize it's it's just one little piece of the revenue you need to figure out, right? You're going to be paying payroll taxes and you get your benefits and, you know, that's part of your plan. You figure out, like, I make X, but I need to make Y in revenue to get X, you know, equivalent when I'm on my own because your cost structure is going to be different. Um, you know, you need to, to, to kind of plan those things out. But to me, those those aren't really the hard parts. You know, you kind of you you look at that, you you run the numbers, and you figure out that's the number I need to hit. I think the the harder thing is understanding like what risks you can tolerate and what you can't. You you can't figure everything out, but how do you you know figure out a game plan where you you've kind of reasonably done that? So in my case, I was executing you know part of my plan on the side while I had a regular income. So I I started to figure out well these are the things that kind of work and don't work. And when I say they work or they don't work, I mostly mean these are the things that other people care about and will spend money for. And these are the things they won't. Yeah. Uh, th that to me is the hardest thing is because otherwise you, you get out there and if your plan's not working, you, you know, you want to make sure you understand why. So, you know, you know, is this a dead end or is this a place that I can make a little pivot and I'll be able to move forward. So understanding, you know, how to, figure out the path is, is really important. Do you have any fear when you, when, when you quit that and once you start spending all this time on your, you know, now you can spend as much time as you want because you don't have the day job in the way that maybe it would stop being as much fun. And maybe, you know, the, the fun part was the hustle you had to do on the weekends or whenever you had time and, you know, you like the break between my day job and, and my night, let's say my night weekend job. Any fear that it would become less fun? Not, not too much. Um, I have an ability to get really focused, and so I can go pretty deep on something, and I don't burn out on it as much. Um, and and when you look at what I'm doing every day, you know, this week I might dive in and figure out, you know, a bunch of infrastructure stuff for my website and my email newsletter. And you know, this week I might be out shooting and this week I might be editing and this week I might be creating a video product. And, uh, you know, this week I'm doing accounting. So the, the things that I actually spend my time on, they, they go in cycles. They vary a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a lot of computer time. That's probably a, a fairly common element to this, you know, pro probably more than is ideal, but, um, there's a lot of variety there. And, and I've got, 
you know, deadlines I set for myself, but I, I do give myself enough flexibility to say, okay, I feel creative now. Let's go edit some photos or, all right, I need to get some stuff done. I'm going to go dive into the books and, and figure out the accounting or, you know, the taxes, whatever it is. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, as part, you talk about the business plan. As part of that, multiple revenue streams, you know, Lumenzi being one of them and, and other revenue streams that you're, you're looking to create? Yeah. So I, I love being an educator. It's something I really enjoy being able to present, to teach other photographers, to help other photographers. I look at Lumenzi as being part of the spectrum of helping other photographers. So there's more things I want to do in, in that arena you know, go deeper on the tutorials and, and things like that. So that's certainly something that I want to invest in. I haven't had the time yet to, to do some of the things I want to do. Right now I'm just kind of doing some of the blocking and tackling uh, of the business, you know, pretty boring stuff, but I need to start creating some new products. Um, you know, otherwise I'm not going to have new revenue. Uh, <laughs> new products. So. <laughs> uh, any, any, I love the, the, when you have something come up with that, I'd love to have you come back and talk about the new product. Uh, that would be great. That yeah. sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Any fear, you know, so one of the things you mentioned this earlier on is, you you know, the people you work with. I, you know, I've been at my same company now for almost 27 years and people have come and gone. But for the most part, I, I really cannot, if you, if you made me pick somebody, I could not pick anybody I didn't like working with. So there's, there's lots of people I've liked working with and really have become like a, a second family. Any fear? Did you develop any you know, relationships there? That, and I know everybody says when they quit, I'll keep in touch. Most people don't. <laughs> Most people, you leave, you're done, you, know, you never really see them much anymore. Any, any emotions around the fact that I'm, I'm leaving my work family? I definitely miss seeing uh, a lot of folks on a regular basis. I, I really, truly did work with just some of the best people. That was the reason I joined this company was the people I work with. And I have so many, so, so many good friends there. Uh, but I, I, I do feel like I'm doing a pretty good job keeping in touch with a lot of folks. Uh, Megan and I are grabbing dinner with uh, another couple we know from work in a couple days. You know, I've been on the phone with a bunch of folks, grabbed coffee with someone yesterday. Um, you know, it's tough though. I mean, my, my old job is 30 minutes away from here. So mm -hmm. the distance can make it a little tough. And of course I travel for my stuff and they're traveling, you know, you know, I was traveling 25, 30% of the time with my job. So that's probably the toughest thing. And then everyone's got, you know, kids and busy schedules and all that. Um, but you know, the folks I really care about the most, we're staying in touch. And, you know, some of those other folks I like seeing, but weren't necessarily the ones I'm keeping in touch with on a daily basis. You know, some of those faces are being replaced with new faces. Other folks I connect with, whether it's on you know the Google forums or um, you know face to face at conferences, or you know I've I've met folks online and been out shooting with folks in Amsterdam and London and Tokyo and all sorts of different places. So you know, as I go deeper uh, in this new world, I'm I'm making a lot of new friends, and it's pretty fun because we have you know this deeply shared passion with photography, which you know, as you know is sometimes hard to blend in with the rest of life if you're chasing the light at odd sure. hours and that sort of thing. So, um, there's a lot of pros there. So, uh, it, it's puts and takes, but, but I, I, I like where things are. Yeah. Any advice you'd want to give to somebody you, you know, other than to have a business plan and the cash, anything not obvious maybe that you would give advice to someone who's thinking about quitting their day job and, and uh, doing this full time. And you mentioned like healthcare, you mentioned it's something to get past, but that's a big item. I don't, if you want to share more on that, I'd like to go to that. But any outside of those obvious things, any not obvious tip for somebody who's thinking about doing this? Well, I, I haven't had enough time to really say I've failed at something yet. So I, I don't have those hard lessons. I'm sure yeah. that's coming for me. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't have that yet. Um, but I, I really think trying to understand the, the people you're trying to help is probably the most important thing. Um, as creatives, we get passionate and self-centered, right? We're all focused on the thing we care about. And if you hold on to that passion, that's good. But if you hold on to that mentality too tightly and you're, and you get too inwardly focused, I think you'll start running into problems pretty quickly. Okay. Okay. So I, that's probably the most important. So if you don't mind me, and you don't have to give any details, but how do you solve the health insurance thing? Because it's even a, for someone who wants to retire at, let's say, 60, Medicare doesn't kick in to 65. 
What What does somebody do for insurance? Well, I, I'm sure it varies tremendously state by state. Okay. Um, you know, so in, in Minnesota, um, there's several different options on the healthcare exchanges. We have something called Minsure, which is kind of our state level implementation of, of Obamacare, right? Okay. So you're, you're talking 5% of the population buys on the independent market. Um, it's a scary thing for sure. I mean, you definitely can get wander on the axle. Um, there's a local company here that's a, a phenomenal company. Um, I knew it was, you know, my preferred vendor and I, you know, called them up in about 10 minutes. We'd walk through all the options. I called back a few more questions. Then here's the price. Um, and it, it wasn't what you think. I, my, this year I'm paying something like 320 bucks a month for healthcare wow, that's and bad. like an extra, it's like an extra 30 bucks a month for dental. Now next year, uh, you know, all the headlines, all the, the, you know, screaming about Obamacare and cost of healthcare. Um, some States, it gets really nasty. Other States is a war level. Um, but that, that's hitting home. Uh, if I wanted to stay on the plan I have now, next year would be 420 bucks. That's so I'm kind of. It's, it's not bad. It's not what you think. I, you know, I thought it might be a lot more. So I'm splitting the difference. I'm going to give up some coverage in terms of like higher deductibles and, and pay a higher, you know, monthly rate. So all in, you know, I'm going to be at something like 450 bucks a month to, uh, to cover that. So if you think about, you got healthcare, um, I used to have my cell phone paid for, that's a new bill for me, yeah. you know, uh, payroll taxes, that's a watch out. You know, people think about the money they take home not the money that your company pays to the government, right? And so you hear a lot of people kind of freak out about taxes. Well, you were already making more than you thought, but one of the parts you didn't see probably is payroll tax. Right. And so you could, you know, tack on, uh, you probably know the exact rate, it's probably like 7.5%, something, 7. somewhere 6. in there. 5. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, uh, you know, it's, that that was probably like the biggest one that surprised me a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then you've got insurance, right? So you, you know, you probably have some level of liability if you're, you know, shooting weddings and, you know, if you're flying a drone, if you're having people into your home office, you know, these are all areas where, you know, you might fail to deliver or you might get hurt or someone else might get hurt. So you need liability insurance, you need equipment insurance, you need uh, disability insurance. You know, if I, if I go out, you know, photographing, you know, on some stream and I fall down and break my legs and I can't go out and continue to shoot, I'm in serious trouble. I'm not part of a company. I can't just work a desk job. That's going to affect my income. So I've got a disability insurance policy. That's a great, that's great. Cause yeah, if you're working for a company, you might've had the company might work with you and still paid you while you're on sick leave or whatever. But when it's you, now you need to have that disability insurance to cover those times. Um, you need to have the insurance. You know that's something that if if you're doing this as a weekend warrior, you probably should have already had insurance. But now that it's your your full livelihood, you definitely need to have insurance. Another thing I hear people, you mentioned drone and and the equipment and all that stuff you need. Um, and it's a it's a kind of a give and take. You know, I need this stuff to make the money, but I don't have the money to to buy the stuff. You got to be very careful about cash flow. You know, you may be able to write these things off in your taxes. But can you cash flow this f- until you can start, you know, making money to to, to live on? And it's not just a matter of covering your costs. You got to live on this month, this stuff. Um, so cash flow is is a huge thing to consider. Yeah, I, I think most people need to be ready to you know take on some level of debt. You know, whether it's buying equipment or just simply bleeding down savings as you exactly. get going. I most people are not going to make money in year one. You know, I hear a lot of people who succeed ultimately, maybe through one, maybe through three, but it takes a while. It does. You have to be. So yeah, you got you got you got to prepare for it. Yeah. Well, I you know we should check back at some point and see how you're doing uh, with this. I I'm I, when I saw that post you did, it's like that is so exciting. I love to talk to Greg. I want to talk to Greg about this because it's a dream of so many people, and I love hearing about somebody who's making it happen. So I wish the best, and I ho- I want to keep hearing success stories from Greg. And when you have new products come out, I want to do that too. Um, well, and if anyone out there, you know, is thinking, you know, seriously about this, you know, give give me a shout, drop me a line. I'd be happy to to chat with folks. You know, give you some feedback on it, or you know, just kind of listen to what you're thinking if you got questions. Um, but you know, get out there, look for other resources. There's a lot of ways to connect. I've 
started connecting with other entrepreneurs who are not photographers, you know, and we share our different business challenges and problems and go through it. And, um, you don't want to go into this alone for sure. Right. Right. All right. Did I mention to you about what's in your camera bag? Yeah, you did. I, now, I don't exactly what uh, you were thinking, but I, I, I brought up the camera bag I have, and I, I just got a drone, so I grabbed that too. <laughs> All right. And that's a great transition because next week we're doing our first drone show. So, and A.D. Wilder, I mentioned him in the pre-show to you, Greg. He's out there in chat now. He's our guest next week to talk about drones. So that would be a great transition to show your drone. So if you don't mind, let's, uh, let's talk about what's in your camera bag. All right. Well, let's, let's start with the drone then. So... <laughs> I uh, I jumped into drones with the uh, the DJI Phantom Pro Three, okay. which I don't know is that two years old. I'm not sure, but uh, um, I've never been able to use it quite as much as I wanted, uh, and I always do at some point on an upgrade. But the, the challenge has been there's a lot of restricted airspace, mm-hmm. and then you get you know rainy days and windy days, and you get you know uh, people and property and you know electromagnetic storms and there, there's there's so many reasons not to put that thing up in the air. Uh, and one of those reasons is it's big. I mean, it's not crazy big, but th- this is the drone. I think I know where you're going. This is, this is the Phantom Pro 3. It's like an here, overnight, it's like a suitcase. You got to check it on the plane. It's bigger <laughs> than my biggest camera bag. Holy now, crap. There is some open space in here. You could put a small camera. It's not all drone, but it's really big. Compare that with, I just got the, the new Mavic, which oh, has a very similar camera. That's what I want. That's what I want. This is it. I have four batteries. The remote controller and the drone are all inside of here. That's incredible. So, Have you got it to fly is, it? <laughs> once. <laughs> um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, well, to wrap myself out here. This uh, <laughs> canvas behind me yeah. uh, is my, the first victim of uh, my drone. <laughs> Uh, so I, I just had got obstacle this. avoidance. You ran it into it. <laughs> I have successfully confirmed that that feature is not 100%. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I like to test everything. I just shouldn't have tested at home was my mistake. Yeah. I, uh, I got this thing two days ago and I was pretty sick and I did not want to go outside, but I kind of wanted to just power it up and make sure, sure it worked. And yeah. it was, you know, I was like, kid on Christmas, like everything was exciting. And, you know, I got this new toy and I, so I unwrap it and I powered up and sure enough, uh, it works. There's, you know, you would expect it probably does, you know, yeah. I'm playing with the camera. I'm like, well, I'll just, I'll just hover it a few inches, just kind of play with it, you know, and kind of goes, well, that's kind of cool. And I bring it up a little bit more and I'm just slowly moving it around. And I wasn't even thinking about the collision avoidance, but it did halt as I got near one of the walls. Yeah. And then it kind of hit me. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, I didn't have that on the Phantom Pro 3, but that's, it's got collision avoidance now. So I was kind of slowly moving around. I'm like, that was kind of interesting. And, you know, at this point, like kind of the engineer in me takes over. And now I got to, you know, push it a little bit further. So <laughs> I, I checked to see, you know, will it, will it still work if I move a little bit more quickly? And it did not respond when I, you know, it, it, it didn't slow down and it didn't respond when I pushed counter on the throttle and it went straight into this canvas. Oh, and boy. ruined it. <laughs> it, it, you, it. You can't dance. see it here, but it, it, chipped, it chipped the front of the canvas off. You can't see it here. It's okay. a you know, 60 inch wide canvas, but mm-hmm. there's a bunch of uh, marks where the blade hit and, and it actually stripped the image off of a, a pretty good chunk of it in oh, one spot. It looks, it looks like a rock from a distance, but up close, it's, okay. it's ruined. So, um, what about the Mavic? It's a good story. Was the Mavic dam- damaged? <laughs> no, not at all. Okay. It, it actually didn't hit that hard. I, I almost got it stopped. It just, I think what happened was it may have sensed me as an obstacle on the other side and wasn't going to let me kind of counter steer. Okay. Because it just, it just didn't want to back off. It kind of kept moving. So, yeah. I Interesting. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you learn things the hard way. Don't fly indoors. Don't fly indoors. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else you want to share there? Um, oh yeah, the uh, the camera bag. So yeah. just to kind of share what. So yeah. Um, you know, I've been traveling out west doing a lot of landscapes. So I've got the uh, eighty to four hundred. Uh, not something people necessarily think about shooting a lot of landscapes with, but long lenses can be great for a lot of landscapes. So this is something that 
Um, I've been shooting with more and more lately. I really enjoy, uh, enjoy this lens. Um, I got the, uh, 16 to 35. This is all Nikon gear. I shoot yep. mostly with a, a D810. Um, I love this lens. It's probably the one I use the most. Uh, it's a great sharp lens. More importantly, it takes filters very easily. So I'll throw on neutral density filters on this for slowing down waves or whatever I'm trying to shoot. Um, I do the 14 to 24. I love that for its wider aperture and its, and its wider focal length. But I, I just honestly I use this a lot more because it's just a, more practical, especially with the ND filters. That's the one um, I, I which was. You can get, go ahead. Uh, I said, which, which you can get on the 14 to 24. There's the Wonder Pano, uh, and I have it. Um, but that thing is, you know, it's like a flying saucer. And yeah. uh, to take that with you traveling, it's just one more thing. What were you saying, Mike? And that's the one I was looking at. I need a wide angle lens for my camera because I went from a, a crop sensor over to full frame, and you know my wide angle was a crop sensor uh, lens, and I, that's what I was looking at, sixteen to thirty five, because the fourteen twenty four was, you know, had some 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 things I didn't want to deal with. One, the the filter issue, um, and it was I think a more expensive too. Um, so the sixteen to the thirty five seemed like the perfect thing that I was looking for. So good to hear that you that you like it. Maybe that's on my future Christmas list. Oh, I I think I take more images with that lens than any other now. Oh, I love that. And the <laughs> the last piece of my kit really is the the D810 with the uh, really right stuff L bracket, which I use love those all the time. I, I love that. Uh, and this is their fifty millimeter f one four lens. Um, I. I don't have a mid-range zoom that I like. I've never, I've heard some good things about some non-Nikon brands. Nikon has never made one that I like. I have a lot of Nikon gear. I love it, but the 28 to 70 is just not a good Nikon lens. And the fact that they jumped to a different filter thread in the light, latest iteration, I just don't feel like carrying two sets of all my filters. So I shoot with primes in the uh, the mid-range there typically. Yeah, it's nice to see another real right stuff. I and mean, you got the L bracket. I love. I it, I bought it with my D2X Nikon D2X years ago, and my Nikon D2H. And so ever since then, I felt like I can't own a camera without the real right stuff L bracket. So I buy every camera I buy. I buy one of those with it. They're they're just awesome. I just completely abuse them, taking them in the ocean, banging around rocks, all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, the only thing, the only complaint other than, you know, the price, which yeah, they're not cheap. honestly, unless you lose it or get stolen, it's going to outlast so many other things you have that it's, it's, it's worth the investment. Um, I've never figured out how to get the legs to not get loose on it. I, I use Loctite and everything else, but I'm always fiddling with an Allen wrench to tighten those legs. That's my one complaint about the really right stuff, legs. The le what are you talking about the legs? The, 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 so the actual tripod, the oh, actual, oh, oh, no, not okay. the L-brake, but the, the tripod legs. Okay. You know, one, sure. it was one of the other things I like about it. I use the black rapid strap and mm -hmm. that, you know, screwing that thing into the bottom of your tripod mount on the, on the bottom of a camera, it'll start to tear that thing up. But, but I, you know, screwed it into, when you had the, the L-bracket on there, screwed it into the L-bracket, it seems to be holding up pretty well. Yeah. Those, those things are tough. Yeah. I, I, you know, I have banged those things into so many different rocks and trees and everything else when I'm hiking and it's, you know, on my back or I'm climbing in weird ways. And, um, you know, it's got the marks to prove it, but <laughs> it's never, it never stops working. It's a protective cage around your camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you for coming back. It's, it's, it's great to catch up on Lamenzia and realize how far behind I am when, when I'm still using version 1.1 1 .1, um, <laughs> and to hear about all the enhancements that you've done since then. And then especially talking about quitting your day job, which is a dream of so many people. Um, so we'll have to follow this up later on and, and see how you're doing. And I really, I, you know, I know what you're planning and all that. This will be a success story. So that's what I'm wanting to hear about later on. Um, so I'll thank be you. happy to come back anytime. And, and thanks sure. for having me again. It's It's been a blast. Yeah, thanks for coming out. So as we go to wrap up, a few things I want to talk about. One, you mentioned working on your website. So I did that too. And I typically when we take off, uh, like we did for Thanksgiving, the two weeks, I try and get some things done. So I did move our site from one place to one host to another. So if you're moving around the site and 
maybe an image doesn't load or something quirky is going on, and still, you know, moving a site isn't always clean. So I'm, I'm, I'm still working through cleaning up some of that site transfer stuff with that. So give me a little bit. It may take this next break. Two, um, I am a couple, I'm a few shows behind getting them posted. So I will hopefully catch that up really quickly in the next uh, week or so. And then three, in addition to the Lumenzia uh, that we're going to buy and we're going to give away to one of our December best of 2016 people, uh, contestants, we also have right now, we're going to get more stuff, but right now we have the Adobe Creative Cloud prepaid one-year membership. And we have an Amazon gift card. So there'll be more more to come. So to watch out on our Facebook group is probably the best place, which is where. Here it is. Facebook.com slash group slash jpdraw. That is the easiest place to enter. You can also enter through our uh, webpage. And there will be a post there about all the information. So be looking out for that. Also, of course, on our Facebook page. You can find it there. I'm also... um, I'm wondering, you know, whether we continue to do it th- through, uh, what is it, YouTube Live that we're doing now, or just do them all over on Facebook. Ad Will and I do a once a month photo review show over on Facebook, and it gets pretty good traffic. Um, so I'm debating on whether we're going to go all there or, or all, or let's keep this mix like that. If you want to get the show live, if you want to get the show live, you got to come here. But if we're going to get the show recorded. We're on iTunes. YouTube and Vimeo for the video portion, Stitcher, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Podomatic, Podbean, and Google Play Music for the audio portion of the show. So either one of those places. And I think our app is still out there in the the Google, was it Google Play Store, the Play Store? And the, what is the... Um, iTunes, that's right, iTunes? Oh, the App Store? The App Store, yeah. So I think it's still out there. Let me pull it up. Let's see if it pulls up. Yeah, yeah, it's still there. There you go. You can go get our app out there. I think it's going to be, I think the company that wrote this is going under. <laughs> so I don't know how much longer it's going to be out there, but you can go get it while it's out there. It's free. Uh, just search for JPEG to Raw in the, in the app store and you can get it for free. I did mention next week we have AD Wheeler on. We're going to be talking about drones. It's our first drone, official drone show. So come out here for that. Then we have one more guest, and then we're going into Christmas break. And then we'll start in a new year. So until next week, keep it raw. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Greg. Thank you.